Lift off. Okay, right. I'm going to kick us off, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, good afternoon and a very warm welcome from myself, Max Gosney, a GHI chairman, and from everybody here on the GHI team to the latest instalment in our webinar series. Uh, we are looking at safety on the ramp and um, we'll be discussing some historic challenges that we, we face around this topic. Uh, the role of equipment and GSE uh, with helping with productivity and occupational health. We're also going to tackle some very new challenges that have been presented by the COVID-19 crisis, looking at uh, the impact of erratic schedules, the impact of bringing um, operatives and team members back to work on the apron after a period of perhaps reduced working or furlough, and some of the safety challenges that that presents. Looking forward to getting our panel's opinions on that in a little while. Um, I'd like to start by saying a big thank you to our headline sponsors. So thank you to uh, Kim, Lilla, Christian, and everyone on the Power Stoves team for getting behind this afternoon's webinar. Thank you very much, guys. Welcome. Okay, um, I hope you're all keeping safe and well. Some of you will be new to the webinar. Some will be returning visitors. I hope that operations are picking up at your stations and that you and your family are keeping safe and well. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to start with an invitation. So please pull out those uh, paper diaries if you still use them, your Outlook diaries or your phone calendars. And I wanted to cordially invite you to join this 22nd annual GHI conference in Copenhagen. Now this is the first time that we're bringing the aviation community together again in person uh, on scale since the crisis struck. So it's a really, really crucial time, as I'm sure you're well aware for everyone in our sector, so much has changed and so changed so quickly. There is the impact on service level agreements, the role of stakeholder collaboration, cleaning, sanitizing regimes on equipment, on stations, the wonderful opportunity we now have to embrace automation to help us tackle some of these challenges. Uh, and we know that there is a thirst out there amongst you guys to get together and to develop that blueprint in person um, and video calls and software using today are great but there's nothing that quite matches that being in the same room and being able to bond and have the conversation and share best, best practice together about working a plan out to bring our industry back to success and growth again in 2021. So please make a note in your diary for the 30th of November to the 2nd of December um, if you've got anything booked, I'm sure it's just Zoom calls, Teams calls, or maybe watching box sets on Netflix, drop those plans and come along and let's get together as an industry and tackle our way and work a blueprint, um, sorry, together for delivering growth, success and operational excellence to address the COVID challenge in 2021. GHI requests the pleasure of your company. Now, um, I know that making that event safe is absolutely critical. Uh, and that's a responsibility that the GHI team take very, very seriously. Delighted to announce, I don't know if you've seen this last week, that we've partnered with ICTS um, to deliver the Sentinel kiosks. Now, these are temperature scanning kiosks, contactless kiosks in trial at Heathrow Airport. They'll give us an instant temperature check on um, all of our delegates as they enter the conference space. So it's just a, one of a number of measures where we can assess the health and well-being uh, of delegates upon entry to the conference and do everything in our power to make sure that the event is COVID safe, COVID secure. We have a number of additional measures taking place too, enhanced sanitizing, cleaning. Um, we have physical distancing and we are, are doing everything we can to embrace COVID safe practice. The Sentinel kiosk we're very excited about and there is a possibility, I cannot guarantee it, but there is a possibility that part of that software will be able to offer COVID testing um, on the day. So we'll continue to look into that and we will pass you on information as soon as we have it. Um, please come along. We want to hold this event and we want to bring you guys together because we know the industry desperately, desperately wants that. And, and just to say as well on that front, early bird rate for the conference ends at the end of uh, today. But for every, all of you good, good people who have logged on to this session and are uh, making time to be with us on this webinar, I will hold that early bird rate for you. So that's a 20% saving. We will hold the early bird for anyone uh, registered and logged on to this afternoon's webinar until the end of the week. So until Friday evening um, to join us. So um, we'll be in touch with details. Thank you very much. Let me get back on topic um, for today. I'll go back and just say that we are here this afternoon to talk about safety on the ramp. 
Uh, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements before we get underway. If you are new, you can leave questions in the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your screens. It's got two little speech bubbles, Q&A. Just drop your questions in there. We're going to have a series of presentations, but we will come to your questions at about 40, 45 minutes in. And please submit as many as you have into that area, and I will pick them up. You will receive a copy of everybody's presentation this afternoon. We'll send those round, probably be tomorrow late morning UK time, and we'll send round a recording of the seminar. We will also be asking you a few questions. We've got a couple of live poll questions set up. When I load those up, I'll give you the cue. You just vote on your preferred option and we'll present the, uh, the results live as and when they come in. Have a bit of software. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel this afternoon. Um, delighted to say we are joined by uh, an array of leading aviation operators to give us their opinion on the ramp safety challenges ahead. Uh, we have Kim Melgaard. Kim, who is International Area Sales Manager at Powerstow. Welcome, Kim. Thank you much. Uh, we are joined by Christian Matosi. Christian is an occupational physician and advisor to Brussels South Charleroi Airport. Welcome to you, Christian. Hello, welcome. Um, and we are joined by Jan Polson. Jan is Safety and Security Manager at SES Ground Handling. So welcome to you, Jan. Hello, everybody. Hi. And we are joined by Gary, Gary Thistlewaite, Thistle who is Health, Safety and Compliance Manager at Stobart Aviation Services. Welcome, Gary. Thank you, Max. Hi, all. Just, uh, just to say that Gary's wife is just three weeks away from her, her due date. And if you do see Gary hot-footing it for the door, um, you'll know why. And please just go, Gary, and get there in time. Uh, thank you. You make sure you do. And um, last but not least, we are joined by Yelma, Yelma Millison, who is Chief Technical Officer for Smart Solutions at Vigo uh, Handler, based in the Netherlands. Welcome, Yelma. Or yeah. welcome back. Welcome back, shall I say, after the sustainability. So the rules of the uh, engagement for the day, we're going to hear mini presentations from all of our panellists, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So I'm going to hand over to you, Kim. First presentation, over to you. Thank you. So, First of all, um, I'd like to say thank you very much for um, being on board today, it's a um, very important subject for power stove, safety, uh, working conditions, uh, are, uh, core values of this company, and actually also the reason why uh, Martin Vestergaard in 2003 decided to found the company. Um, so um, that is uh, really something that we are keen about. And you can say, why, why this? Uh, yeah, um, this is a hard job. I mean, every day to handle uh, tons of uh, suitcases, cargo, that, that, is not, that is something that you not uh, get around without getting a bill one day if you don't do something about it. Um, from different studies, and I'm sure that uh, some of uh, uh, my colleagues in the panel today will also be able to say it about, uh, the impacts it has to be working uh, inside a cargo hold. For sure that the, the manual uh, baggage lifting and handling has an effect. Uh, we have seen from different kinds of studies uh, that uh, uh, one third or maybe even up to 40% of this caused that uh, employees get injuries. Uh, and uh, I said again, that has a price for the one working, also a price for the employee. Uh, it costs money, it costs um, your health, and um, that is uh, really for us key factors to do whatever we can to help, um, let's say, reduce that. Um, some of the things on the screen we can see, for example, there's uh, table number one, that is actually a study, a survey that was made in the US uh, where they asked uh, 10 airlines and two handlers were about um, 156. Uh, baggage handlers, um, what would cause uh, mostly uh, bag injuries, and it turned out to be that 70% of them um, meant that that was inside the cargo hold. So, as I said, it's a hard work when you have nothing to help you doing this. Uh, a lot of uh, heavy lifting, twisting, 
Uh, you don't know what's coming to you. It can be a bag that looks big and can be 10 kilos. It can be a small bag. When you uh, touch it, it's maybe 35 kilos. Um, so, tough job. There is, uh, can be injury compensation cost, as said, lost work days. You could have a high staff turnover because people uh, very fast realize that this is maybe not the job for them because it's uh, too uh, heavy. And then, of course, you need to find out what to do, hiring and training new employees. So uh, to, to be able and assure that the people, uh, let's say, working for you uh, will uh, still be working whole through the day and uh, keep on working, uh, th that is, uh, let's say, I think it's a question for many uh, employers. Uh, so um, what do we do about that? Oh, it's a little bit slow. That's why we come into the picture with Power Stove and the reason why we did this. Uh, first of all, now it's showing it's docking on the aircraft. That's because the issue is not only about them. The man is also about the airplane. So be assured that everything around operation is safe. Uh, and when that is uh, done, of course, it's important to see what's happening inside the hole. In this case, to assure that you have uh, something to help you uh, get rid of the, let's say, the heavy lifting, the turn around in the back, uh, shoulder injuries. And that's why we also see like here to have something to help you stack the suitcases when you're inside. We have, uh, for the last uh, 17 years, of course, been in contact with many clients. We have many users around the world. And uh, we also, uh, let's say, working close with them to find out what is then happening, what is the outcome when they are working with the power stove. Uh, I took two of them with me today. One is uh, KLM, who actually, when they started to use the power stoves, power stoves. Uh, test, had a test to see what effect would it be on the, on the body injuries? And as you can see, uh, until they got the, the, the roller tracks, uh, and after that, actually, they could reduce uh, body injuries with about 50%. The other one is uh, from, uh, maybe from Christian, a well-known area for you, but uh, also showing that uh, to have something to help you doing the hard work, uh, will also uh, help you to reduce injuries. The last, um, well, one of the last points I want to mention is about the question about the COVID-19. Um, and uh, which also will be a topic today, how to keep the social distancing in the cargo hold. Uh, but also, let's say, to assure how do you get a good start again. Um, with a power stove, you are using one guy inside, so you are keeping the distance, and that's actually also what we are experiencing at the moment, also from uh, from new clients that they are seeking something that will assure that uh, you keep the social distancing. And you can say this has we actually been doing from the day we started to produce the power stove. Um, so this is, uh, of course, also a matter about. Uh, in this case, how do you then uh, fulfill your standard uh, operation procedures um, that you can be assured that your operation is doing well, that you have uh, the on-time performance done. And then we know with uh, the power stove, from our experience, that you actually can improve your turnaround with up to 30%. Um, and then, of course, it's a matter about how do you do the personal protective equipment or the PPE. Uh, I think maybe it depends on the local rules. I've been around during this crisis and there can be different, um, let's say, um, inputs from where you are. But end of the day, it's everything about keeping the distance, use masks when you have to, or gloves when you're inside um, to protect the best way possible. Then uh, finally, I'd like just to uh, add uh, that we're not, uh, let's say, from that uh, we are an innovative company. So we're not only thinking about what's happening outside at the airplane. I know today is more what's happening on the ramp, but what's happening on the ramp also has an effect about what's happening inside in the sorting area. So this is um, 
a fairly new uh, product that we launched uh, last year. Uh, and this is from Copenhagen Airport, which have been um, a good help in, uh, let's say, in testing how this is working on uh, the health and safety side, um, both from the airport, from the handlers, and uh, also from their health and safety um, people. And with this, as you can see, this also helps to keep fewer injuries, it actually increases your productivity and at the same time make sure that your baggage, you get less damage and so on. So just to show you that for us, uh, we are trying to, let's say, uh, have a um, connection not only outside, but also inside, so that so the, a red connection holds through the system. I think I kept the eight minutes or maybe just about. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Uh, you get a gold star because uh, I think you were you were right on the eight minutes. Thank oh. you. Um, so very interesting. <laughs> well That's done. Um, very interesting vi video footage there. And um, uh, please, if you have any questions about what you've just seen, um, just drop them in the Q&A uh, section and your questions will be directed to Kim. Uh, once we conclude our final presentation. I'm now going to hand over to Christian for our second presentation. So over to you, Christian. Okay, thank you for inviting me to participate at this webinar. Uh, this is the first one for me in English. I'm doing in English, so thank you for being kind to my accent and my understanding of English. Please speak slowly and uh, clearly if you ask me questions. Uh, first of all, I want to point out that I have no conflicts of interest with PowerStore. I'm not a team member of PowerStore. I'm a, a freelance uh, occupational physician. Um, I have no conflicts of interest, but I have a huge interest in prevention and worker safety. So the title of my presentation is is the power store conveyor effective in improving the handling in aircraft hold? Here you have the results of five years of research at Charleroi Airport. Um, I would like to, to add some compliment uh, at the, the presentation of Kim. Uh, Kim, you, you, you mentioned that um, the average baggage uh, weight is uh, four to five tons per day. But at BSCA during the summer, we recorded up to 14 tons per day. And um, you mentioned also back and shoulder injuries, but you have to know that uh, knees also is a body part uh, is injured by the handling. So Brussels South Charleroi Airport, BSCA, is used by numerous low-cost airlines. And in In 2008 and 2009, we recorded an increase in workplace accidents, more particularly in the aircraft hold. In 2010, BSCA invested in new equipment, the Power Store Extendable Roll Track Conveyor, to assist handlers while manually loading an aircraft hold. The benefit uh, of experience, training and use of mechanical equipment during baggage handling in a kneeling posture in the aircraft hold is largely unknown. And in 2014, we decided to assess the efficiency of the power store conveyor and check how handlers work with it. But, because there is a but, scientifically, to assess if the use of power store is more effective than the conventional luggage belt, it's necessary to evaluate the two activities. And currently, the use of power store is almost systematic at BSCA. So please, don't try to replace them with an old baggage belt. Users have given the answer. However, we can assess how the handlers work with it. And is it effective? We will see that. We used the expert and novice approach developed by some Canadian authors. This study was carried out in collaboration with the health and safety manager of the airport. 
So in 2015, we filmed two groups of workers using GoPro cameras to compare their postural movement strategies while handling hold luggage. The groups were made up of experts and novices, including trainings from the training center with a minimum of five years and less than five years experience respectively. After 15 days of filming, more than 12 hours of sequences were analyzed to identify specific postures and movements correlated to level of experience. Here you have an example of what we observed in the field. On the left, you have the expert strategy. He waits until the last moment to grab the luggage and drop it quickly. Trunk rotation is limited and the loading head of the conveyor is adjusted in height. On the right, you have the novice strategy. He reaches to grab the luggage, pulls it towards himself and drags it until he puts the bag down. Trunk rotation in this case is about 180 degrees and the loading head is not adjusted in height. We have listed and named several gestures and techniques observed which allowed us to develop our concept of hold handling triangle, where each element is correlated to the others. Here you have an example of some gestures we, we observed in the field. And with all this valuable information, next we produced a video comparing the handling strategies used with a power store conveyor. The video, about 13 minutes long, is structured around the three main chapters of our hold handling triangle, which each go through numerous handling strategies and safety tips. This movie was shown during the online sessions, uh, training sessions, or during the annual medical examination with the occupational physician, me. And in addition, this video is also shown during each training group session. Currently, we are still continue, continuing this work to ensure that all handlers and trainees take part in the training. After a survey with baggage handlers, more than half of them say they had changed their handling technique. Since the introduction of the power store conveyor, the handling department has observed a decrease in the number of accidents in the hold, followed by an increase and a further decrease. But the trend is, however, downward. Note that 2016 was the year of the terrorist attacks in Brussels, and VSEA has a lot of uh, had a lot of works and more uh, accidents. So this is the first training video on handling aircraft hold luggage with power store conveyor, and we highlight uh, five benefits in our of our training video an increased awareness of trainees, hands-on learning, a transfer of knowledge between colleagues, participatory and gratifying aspects, and a fast and sustainable learning. But periodic retraining should be organized regularly. Obviously, more in-depth studies should be carried out and the results should be compared with those of other airports. What is the take home message I can deliver to you? Uh, whatever the activity, the expert and novice principle can be reproduced at your workplace. Experts have developed various strategies that are not taught and explained in standard training. We could not have been able to show these strategies if we had not observed workers in the field. This knowledge transfer makes it possible to provide adequate training to workers and improve safety. Collaboration between the various players in the field is necessary. Health and safety department, employer and employees. Thank you. Christian, thank you very much. Very interesting slides. Thank you for your insight and look forward to picking up some of your, uh, your, your findings there with you um, later on when we open it up. Um, now I'm going to hand straight over to Jan. If you're ready to go, Jan, we will pass through to your presentation. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, after the coming back uh, from the 
sent back home for almost three months in Copenhagen. We have uh, been in the same situation as everybody else all over the world, I think, that we have to say goodbye to a lot of very good people. And uh, that includes uh, some loading staff and sorting staff. In uh, Copenhagen, uh, loading staff and sorting staff in the baggage area is in the same department and can work in the uh, opposite area if they want to. Uh, this has redundancies has caused that we uh, have a lot of unexperienced staff, new staff on the ramp. They've been here for many years, but it's many years they have handled an aircraft. So we have put a, a trainer on the shoulder of everybody coming from the sorting area. They are trained in basic equipment, that's barrel loader, uh, baggage tractor, which they did in the sorting area as well. And um, a, a transporter for transporting pallets from your lower deck loader to uh, trolleys. That's the only thing they are trained in. And um, they have to sign a paper after a few weeks that they are okay with this. And the trainer is on them during the whole shift. Uh, on top of that, we have some uh, managers on the RAM who have made a four hour safety seminar, which all staff will be uh, set up for during uh, next month. Yeah, please. Uh, about the social distance reduced on the turnaround, uh, the only problem that we see about the social distance uh, for the load, uh, loading unloading is uh, if we handle the heavy items inside the hold. We need two, two men inside the hold. Otherwise, it's uh, very good uh, in Copenhagen for the restroom and meeting rooms, all chairs is placed with a distance of one meter and daily briefing meeting is held twice. To minimize the amount of staff, all staff meetings are canceled or held via Teams chats. We don't have big meetings anymore. All rooms are cleaned twice a day. And uh, we do have continuous spraying of table chairs, refrigerators, coffee machines, microwaves, you name it, at all times. Uh, equipment with an operator cabin is uh, equipped with uh, a liquid bottle and paper rolls for cleaning of steering wheels and other systems operated by hands, and that's done for every new operator using the equipment. And it's placed several placements in the sorting area as well and in restroom, and as I said, in all equipment. Are you moving around in the terminals or in gates? All passengers and staff have to wear medical masks. That is a problem for some passengers, but uh, we'll, we will handle that. We have Copenhagen security to help us. Uh, to take care of the staff, we do have some uh, equipment as uh, we are using. Can I have the next player, uh, Sorry. Thank you. Uh, we are using... Uh, Power store bell roller, I'll come back to that. But uh, to handle heavy equipment, uh, oh, sorry, heavy uh, items, we do have a modified CLT8 loader where we put some panel lifters on. And this is to operate all items weighing more than 79 kilos, which is the uh, rule in Denmark from the Health and Safety Department. We do use these small pallet lifters inside the hold for Airbus 320 family, B757, etc. And it's uh, start with build up with the uh, platforms, supporting platforms to avoid that we are damaging the cargo hold, the floor and the cargo hold with the pallet lifter. All items have to be on forkliftable pallet and we are using the small pallet lifter inside and out of the cargo hold. Uh, we are in progress of uh, making a risk assessment for a power store platform to be used for these heavy items, which can be used on all CLTA loaders. So we will take the, the platform off, as you see on this picture, and it will be used on all CLTA loaders. And uh, on the next slide, you can see the one that we are using on uh, 7.3s. 
ATR and the flight like that. It's an electrical lifting table to avoid that the staff have to lift up the cargo inside and out of the hold. Uh, and the last slide, we do have the belt roller that we're using. As I mentioned, we are using power stove as well, and the staff is very happy for that power stove belt. We do have another type, Mulak, as you can see, we have put on a front lifter and a rear lifter, which will help, like you saw on the power stove video for handling baggage inside the sorting area. This is the same system inside the cargo hold and outside for the trolleys. And if you turn to the next slide, you can see on the trolley, Cherry. The, the rear lifter is just moving into the uh, trolley and the baggage is just to be slided in or out. And the front lifter is the one that only to be put inside the cargo hold, which is very good when you're handling, uh, especially CRJ 900 or similar, where uh, the belt is pretty long from the uh, cargo hold. All these equipments are helping our staff in the daily uh, handling for back injuries, shoulder injuries, knee injuries, as you all know. So um, we're pretty happy about this. And it has been a very low figure for a very long time. I did speak a little bit fast, so uh, this is actually the end of my presentation. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. It's, uh, we're on for a record. It's like we're breaking the world record here. Uh, some excellent timing today. And um, we look forward to picking some of those uh, themes up with you and points that you've made a little later on, Jan. And if you have any questions from Jan or any of the previous presentations, just a reminder, there are already quite some questions in here, but submit them in the little Q&A um, forum uh, icon with the two speech bubbles at the bottom of your screen as we go along. And I'll come to those in uh, a little while. I will now hand control over to Gary, um, if you're ready to go, Gary, for our next presentation. Here we go. Hi, everybody. Um, so I think this is more of a story of our coronavirus six months in uh, six slides. So um, let's go straight into it. So a little bit about our story and I'll move on. All day. So, Stubber Aviation Services were a ground handling service provider uh, in the United Kingdom and three years ago started operations uh, just in London South End Airport uh, near the capital of the UK. Uh, we enjoyed some uh, good growth, we started new stations, we started into cargo um, and into a different country up in Scotland as well and then coronavirus got in the way of our ambitions uh, earlier this year so we uh, had to respond to that. Uh, so what did it mean for us? Sorry, there's a small delay. Okay, so we knew that we had to act fast and I, and I think what we were really good at as a, as a team were we were small and nimble enough to uh, react to the pandemic situation uh, we've always held innovation at the core and we, we actually saw some positives in the coronavirus and, and this is a story I'd like to tell you today. So quickly when the pandemic hit and lockdown rules came into place, uh, we basically put all of our heads together as a leadership team um, and we put calls in to make sure that we gave support to all the stations and in fact that call still goes on every day to this day. What that means is actually we've found that we're actually closer together during the pandemic, which is uh, quite crazy to say. Um, we find that actually that uh, we're, we're dealing with problems quickly and giving people, the, again, the support that they need. So um, it was very good that we were agile enough to do that. And I think that was already there before the pandemic hit. And I think the readiness that we already had uh, allowed us to do that. I think the last six months particularly, we, it allowed us to look at ourselves and th there's a lot of noise, especially with the, the varying different uh, guidance and the, the, the different bodies that were throwing guidance down into the industry. And actually, uh, we took that time to look at ourselves as a business and what we were doing, where we had come from, and, and again, tried to put the positives out of the pandemic situation. 
So I think that was made, basically we felt we were going at such a rate that um, we needed a bit of an, an operation reset and uh, and how how that we come out of the other side of coronavirus uh, in future. And again, I said there, there's a lot a lot of noise, especially in the UK. We had the government, we had the national health uh, system uh, who were providing updates. We have IATA, the CAA here. So there was lots and lots of guidance as well as our partner airlines and partner airports who were giving us different levels of guidance, which sometimes conflicted. So we made it very clear that having that agile team that we're able to review all of the guidance and just put the, the, the most stringent measures in place and allow us to stay successful during uh, the pandemic. And actually we, we saw that in our track record, uh, especially with OCP, safety increased in fact, and so we actually, again, it's, it's a positive that's come from the pandemic. Um, and again, the strong belief that we all have, uh, again, by just looking at ourselves and not just looking at the problem of the coronavirus, was we, we, we see an end to the coronavirus and we see an end to this response and we, we look to get the confidence back in the industry where people like to go on holiday and people like to take business trips once more. And we actually feel that we're in a much stronger place now than we were actually going into the pandemic. So. Again, there is a positive to be had in that. So how did we do that? We, we had to, again, we're, we're five stations around the UK, but it's quite a large spread. So we're into Scotland and all the way down to London. Uh, it's about 600 miles or a thousand kilometers uh, between the stations. So we needed one common approach to make sure that everybody was able to uh, follow the guidance and. Uh, and that's on the safeguards that we put into place. And we did that with collaboration and standardization. And again, uh, working with some of our fantastic customer airlines and the airports that we operate at. And obviously with our sister company being an airport operator themselves, we were able to learn much from them as well. Um, so that did help us, uh, especially for the kind of the passenger experience. Now, obviously what we wanted to do is make sure that people were at the forefront of uh, what we were doing around the response and colleagues we had to keep them safe so we do that by minimizing the transmission so far as we could uh, obviously yeah, you know in some holds it's it's quite uh, it's very confined in there but we operated things like one in one out systems just to kind of mitigate that uh, and again, just back to that noise piece again, I, I'm not sure how uh, some of the other people in the different countries found uh, the, the different gov government responses, but there was very, there was a lot of conflict and advice. There was people from non-scientific backgrounds providing advice, but we had to stay on point. We had to kind of leave our emotions at the door. Um, obviously it was, especially for me, I mean, my partner is also in aviation, so we, we you know, them things you have to leave at the door when you come to work. And we let risk assessment drive the process. So we made sure uh, that we had the minimum safety standards in place. Uh, and again, based on scientific evidence. And what we like to do here, we don't really focus on compliance. Um, again, it's for us as a, a tick in the box, uh, but we did want that obviously as a, as a, as a base, but we wanted um, again, just to be better than that and apply the most stringent policies, guidelines and best practices from those varying sources, we put that into kind of one package for the station, uh, especially for them returning from uh, either furlough leave or working at home. And again, uh, just to echo back to that noise because it was very stressful, um, not really knowing which way to turn sometimes, but just keeping simple. Um, in fact, uh, you know, we just always went back to that core approach of if we social distance, then we'll get through this and we'll do our bit to help the industry. Um, we saw actually, in, I think at first uh, we thought maybe two weeks, three weeks in lockdown, it quickly turned into months. Uh, and then we did start to bring back some colleagues after three or four months of, of lockdown in many of the stations. Uh, and that, that, that were those people working at home. And we found that they were very, very apprehensive and we had to instill confidence. So a lot of the training, um, actually when they returned back into the workplace was around feelings and, and, and putting um, any trepidations that they might have at ease. Uh, but actually we really used the, the, the time at home really well to, uh, to look at other training in terms of compliance. And, and the big thing that we did, we, we maintained uh, our communication. It was a key thing we had to do. Um, 
we just made sure that we wrote to people, we spoke to people, we picked the phone up to people just to see how they were getting on. And I think that um, that just allowed us to have a much smoother transition back into the workplace for a lot of our guys. Uh, so just moving into it again, this is the key message that we I think we've really took out of coronavirus is it's a very negative situation, but there's so many positives that we found in this. And, and although volumes have really devastated, or reduced volumes devastated the industry, we, we look again to reflect on ourselves and get ready for coming out of the other side because we do see a future past COVID. And again, what we did, we, we went back to basics. We looked at our safety management system. It was a very compliance-based safety management system. We were adding a lot more behavioral-based safety elements in there, which we find in, is paying dividends. Um, lockdown, I think some, um, someone else said it as well, that you know, we're not able to train, we're not able to meet in classrooms anymore. So we were a very heavily instructor-led um, training organization. We've now moved to computer-based training via Teams and Zoom, and, um, and, and but actually a blended learning experience, which again is, is paying dividends in, in safety performance. And it didn't just focus on the front line, actually. What we realized is that you know, we, we shouldn't have people in management positions who are telling people below them how to do their jobs if they're not trained in the same uh, functions. So we've really gone from the top and it's great to have a, a managing director and a leadership team in the business uh, that have, have taken the training on board and, and what we want to do from the safety perspective and allowed us to, uh, to take their time up to, to be trained. And our level of proficiency and the knowledge and expertise we have as a, as a leadership team has, has, has vastly improved. So again, that makes us stronger coming out of the other side of uh, COVID-19. Um, so just in terms of um, actually a lockdown situation, so we've actually found that we improved. So just some, um, again, I won't read through the full text there, but this behavior-based uh, system about preventative um, measures in ter terms of stopping incidents before they happen. We already had a great safety record, which we're very proud of. Uh, but you can see that in terms of near misses, we kind of uh, trundled along there uh, for kind of 12 months. And then we had a massive focus. So you can see there that it's not because we have more time out on the ramp. We've actually got less time because we're, we're more uh, time pressured than before. But the increase in, in safety is there and the focus is there. And we're seeing that again, the near misses and the turnaround inspections. We did take a dip as we went into restrictions, but we quickly, once we put the safeguards in place, got the focus back on safety and, and made sure that although we were dispatching aircraft, uh, that we were still doing that safely. And in fact, we're, from here, we're safer than we were before, uh, especially when we rationalize this against pre-COVID numbers. So again, we're, we're gonna take that momentum out of the other side. Um, and, and those numbers are fantastic. The quality in there is also um, excellent, especially for a, a three-year-old business. So we are very proud of, of what our colleagues have achieved during this tough time. And then lastly, um, again, more for those countries who haven't um, had stricter guidelines, but these were the most restrictive measures that we found based on all the different um, areas of guidance. So we, again, we looked to be partners with our customers and with the airports we operated at. We made sure that risk assessments were relevant and that they uh, ensured best practices were in place. Uh, we spent a ton of time in terms of preparation and getting people involved in what we need to do, especially using the stakeholders. Uh, who were coming, uh, who were involved in that process. Um, again, a lot of, of effort has gone into social distancing in workplaces. You can see a lot of that on the right hand side. Um, we've done one in one out systems again, so just to kind of really look at the social distancing turnaround and the challenges that presents. Um, and we've actually found not to be a problem for us. Um, we're doing regular cleaning. Um, I think like most people, uh, PPE is standard, so face coverings are always been in place and the UK government made it mandatory this week in all, all spaces outside of workplaces, but we've just had that in place anyway. I've got my Stobart Aviation Services one right here for good measure. Um, I think, again, the key one going back to how do we reintegrate people back to the workplace was about the sessions that we led. We made it about them. It was quite fortunate that Mental Health Awareness Month fell at the same time, so we did a lot around that. It was quite tough for some people sat at home um, as well, who, uh, and we've got a real good partner in terms of uh, occupational health as well that we got during lockdown, so it was another a bonus for us. 
Um, and the one there you can see, we actually established social distancing champions that they highlight people know who they are, people they know the questions, uh, the answers to the questions that people may have. Uh, they make sure that all of the PPE and the safeguards are monitored and it's not just the management. So we've got a real great engagement at all levels of the hierarchy in terms of coronavirus response. And I think the main one, that especially it taught me, I've been in aviation only five years now. Um, we had some uh, really good emergency response plans, but not, nothing for pandemics. <laughs> so if one thing, we also got a pandemic uh, LERP out of that. So um, I'm sure in future, if there are any more, we'll be well equipped to deal with that. But um, certainly that was my biggest learning was uh, how do we deal with it in future? Uh, that brings me to the end of my slides. I'm happy to take any questions at the end of the session. Um, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Gary, for sharing your story with us. And um, please submit your questions for Gary in, in the Q&A section, and we will get to those um, after our concluding presentation, which is from Jelma, Jelma Mellison. Over to you, um, if all the technology holds up. Um, Thank you very much for this uh, introduction, Max. Um, happy to see um, a lot of you again and looking forward to meeting in Copenhagen indeed. Um, well, in the, just like um, Christian said, I also don't have any, um, well, uh, any interaction with, uh, with Power Store. <laughs> I'm just a happy customer of their uh, product. And um, I am a um, former baggage handler. So when I was in university, I lifted, uh, well, apparently, according to Christian, multiple of tons over a couple of years. And indeed, uh, being a nice baggage handler, I saw the benefit of the uh, Power Store system. Uh, nowadays, Chief Technology Officer at Figo, um, a ground handler in the Netherlands, and I'm happy to tell you a bit more if this works. Yes, it works. Indeed, what was the impact um, uh, of, of COVID concerning the safety in the turnaround process? Well, what we have learned is that we really we reached out to the airlines um, to collaborate that we make sure that we have the same procedure that we have don't don't have any misunderstanding for example um, at one specific airline we agreed the captain comes out of the cockpit to give the load sheet or the loading instruction reports etc so we make sure are we all on the same page so we really reached out to our airlines to make sure we have the right procedures um, everybody agreed stay out of the bubble both passengers uh, staff crew just keep respect three chickens of space in between apparently uh, also um, obviously the turnaround time was massively increased so you have a lot more time for the boarding process for the disembarking process um, everybody understood and I think even passengers understood and and Usually, obviously, an aircraft needs to fly to make revenue, whereas in this case, there was a little bit of overcapacity in the market, so um, that was not, not that much of an issue. Obviously, it's, it's a serious situation. And at the same time, we did more intense cleaning. Uh, new type of, of cleaning products, which were used in the deep cleaning overnight, etc. cetera. Um, longer cleaning in turns, so that was basically concerning safety in the turnaround process. Restarting operations. I think Gary also mentioned um, we can't do classroom training anymore. Um, what we have learned is we just, um, well, we, we planned a lot of trainers to walk around on the ramp in the terminal. Um, when we restarted operations, we were never in a full lockdown, but when we restarted operations, we made sure we had heaps and heaps of trainers available everywhere. So you could always reach out to a trainer, but we actually gave our trainers a message please walk around speak to everyone make sure are you comfortable in what you're doing um we were never in a full lockdown situation so everybody did work but just maybe a little bit less frequent so we just made sure we had trainers and they were walking outside not in classrooms uh not via zoom or teams because it's quite difficult to explain to someone how to use um how to do a pushback operation via via well, via teams so we just um, send out all of our trains with a clear message just train everyone and make sure you're available our biggest challenge was focus basically and and we noticed we actually had some, some maybe even some more near, near misses uh just like what you measured uh, gary because um normally when you come on the job, you have, say, in a, a nine hour shift, a seven hour shift, you are continuously working. Whereas due to COVID, um, the volume has decreased so much. You come in, you clock in, you do 
one turnaround, then you don't do anything for four hours, and then you do another turnaround. And actually, we, we learned that it was more difficult to stay focused if you have more time. So um, we didn't necessarily resolve that, but at least we were aware of it. And we also keep, um, we, we are measuring indeed our, our near misses. Now, concerning physical distancing, um, what Kim also said, with the power stove product, you only need one guy in the hold. Um, and, and basically what we said is as soon as we started, we started operations again, we have some old conventional belt loaders and we have power stoves. Basically, we're not using the conventional belt loaders anymore um, because having just uh, the power stove product means you can only, you only need one guy in the, in the hold. And uh, I'm not a virologist or anything, but with all of these aerosols and blah, 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 I don't know what it's going to do, but we at least send just one guy in the hold. Um, and then they don't need to wear a mouth uh, covering because even though the power product obviously helps, it's still a heavy job loading and unloading an aircraft. Um, other PPEs, obviously, well, uh, uh, gloves for everyone who wants it, more cleaning gel, more intense. Uh, just like um, uh, the rest of you said, we've moved the chairs apart in our um, canteen. And, and well, staff that encounters, um, say, passengers all have to work close together, wear mouth masks. But if you work on the ramp and if you are, well, if you're in the hold by yourself, we don't ask you to wear a mouth mask. You can, but we don't obligate it. Um, what are the opportunities or what we're looking at, at, at apart from, from basically the things we're already doing? Uh, to me, that's why I put in these trees basically a piece of paper is just a dead tree who should have been in the forest um, and we're in Vigo we are going 100% paperless so there is no paper on the ramp anymore apart from the fact that it brings you costs it actually helps because you don't have to hold on to something give it to someone else possibly disinfect that or not um, the communication is a lot easier because you can just send messages to some other people without having to verbally communicate or shout out the amount of um, bags that go in hold number two. So um, I think we were already made a big step, but now we are 100% paperless. So if you don't print, you don't need to bring it somewhere. So you reduce your movements and at the same time actually brings you efficiency. Uh, another thing, it's quite interesting to see this panel indeed, that we're not the only ones who are working on it. Um, how do we minimize the risk of, of heavy duty work? Because indeed, uh, being a baggage handler is an amazing job, but maybe you don't want to do that for, for 30 years. Um, and what we have done in Figo is um, everybody's multi-skilled. So you don't just handle bags, you also drive the pushback, the catering truck, the lavatory truck, etc. So everybody, if you want to learn, you can really grow and you, you obtain a lot of skills. So if you come on duty and you have an eight hour shift, you might be in the baggage hall for two hours, then do the catering trip for an hour, then do four pushbacks and then unload two aircrafts. So that would be just a regular day um, working for Vigo. Um, so if you really are multi-skilled, you do a lot of different movements, it actually is less strain on, on the body. And also, um, you well, you you divide the heavy work over a bigger pool of staff, because what we see at some other um, handlers, for example, once you reach the level of pushback driver, you are just a pushback driver. Um, in Vigo, you are still a pushback driver, but also you need to lift bags. So, multi-skilled is is really helping minimizing the um, the, the the load on on individual staff. At the same time, what we see now due to COVID, the volume has decreased. If everybody is multi-skilled, it's far more difficult to keep everybody really, like, you know, really experienced because if you do things less often, then you lose your experience. Um, I think Kim also said uh, um, that the um, uh, power store also has the, the transfer belt product. And actually we are also one of the uh, proud users of that product. So um, this actually also helps us to um, well, reduce the, um, the load on the individual staff. I wouldn't say it necessarily goes faster, but people are obligated to work with this machine. And then actually, if you are obligated to work and you do it in a smart way, then um, it really reduces the strain on the human body. 
brings me back to what Christian says. It's not just about um, having products, it's also about the use of products. And what we have seen indeed is um, people lift heavy things and it's really putting a strain on, on, on the lower back usually. So what we did was we hired a team of four physiotherapists and they walked around our airport for quite a while and they made um, um, a video called Back School, which is a 60 minute video on how to properly lift. Um, and they really, they, they said that it's not necessarily bad for you to work at the airport as long as you adhere to the rules. So how do you lift, etc. So we are really training people on how to lift properly because in the end we have all these machines and we have a lot of nice procedures but if people still don't work very savvy they will destroy their backs in a couple of years so that's what we have been doing at that uh, at vigo to to minimize the risk of um well uh, musculoskeletal well, injuries and indeed to conclude um i have faith i know we're going to overcome this this crisis, but fate is not enough. Uh, we need a plan. And I saw from Gary and Lee, you have a really good, uh, good approach to that. So kudos on you, Gary. Um, and at the same time, focus on what's important. So indeed, uh, what is important nowadays? What do we need to resolve today? What do we need to resolve next week? And what will we resolve in a later stage? And at the same time, uh, technology can help overcome many challenges. I mean, for Vigo, we're going 100% paperless. Um, and I think every handler can, can achieve the same. It will not just, just reduce the, uh, say, the, uh, the, the amount of phys uh, physical communication points we have, but actually will bring you efficiency as well. Yeah. And last but not least, come on guys, crisis is almost over. Be brave, be kind, and be the you you wanna look back on and be proud. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jelma. Excellent presentation. Um, thank you all. That brings us to the close of the formal presentations. Um, first question off the bat that I will, I'll ask our panel uh, is from Soren, Soren Jensen, who asks, on the focus of health and safety for the baggage handler, where do you see the, the future develops, uh, developments in technical equipment uh, helping to minimise the workload? I mean, just to add to that, and I'll perhaps come to you, Kim, on it, that a lot of the equipment um, that we see that Jelma's has just shown, I guess it's facilitating a human operative in performing a task. Mm. Do you see that as the way that developments and innovations will go, or are we going to see a, a path of full automation where it's just not a facilitation of a human, it is replacing that task with a, a fully automated um equipment i mean which path do you think the industry will follow will it will it be a bit of both that's a very good question um and uh, if i had the answer i would maybe not tell it to you <laughs> no, what i mean is that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, aspects uh, in this and uh, to to have a full automation inside a cargo hold is not just to doing that i mean i know there's a lot of work uh, in different areas uh, for robots and so on and maybe that will come one day, uh, but but you know uh, a suitcase or, or post sack whatever is not uh, just that easy to let's say identify and carry out of the hold. So still for a long time there will still be a human factor. I think what is important is to look at how do we then treat uh, the the person inside the hold. I mean, end of the day we all resources and. Uh, uh, resources uh, we, we need to stay fit so we can work together and uh, achieve the goals that we want to do in the company so I don't I don't think we will see that for for some time maybe I'm wrong uh, somebody could sit in the garage and work on this you never know but for now I don't think so and um, right now it's, it's more a matter about that how, how do we improve what we have and uh, like in this company yes we still have focus on how can we develop what's happening inside we're definitely also looking at what's happening outside. So uh, from, let's say, from the airplane and further on into the, to the sorting area, and you can see what we're doing already in the sorting area. But um, that, that, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, things to, to, uh, to look at, and, and it's uh, not that easy. Um, but, but definitely um, the hard job as it is, you know, um, we need to look at what we can do to improve it, definitely. Get a throw it out to one of our handling, uh, ground handler representatives on the panel, but 
where where do you guys see that sort of future travel is it going to be facilitation of humans performing these loading tasks and offloading or do you think that this will now be the the, the prompt for full automation and, and looking at a different way of doing things um i'll take this one um, yeah go, go. I, don't, I don't think so um I, mean, I don't think even in my lifetime and i think i'm i'm, I'm quite young into the safety career in, in aviation but I think you go from 70 to 75 percent labor uh, in the in the ground handling community, especially uh, unless the design of aircraft change. I just don't think we'll ever see mm. some swing out to, to get to zero. Um, I certainly think the next 15 years will be not displacing people, but actually a different function that they'll take on. So I think we've seen that with some of the innovations that we've done where we've introduced kind of, you know, computer based elements, but we've not taking the staff out to, to replace that, if that makes sense. We, we use them to focus on other areas. So I think that's probably our best focus. And so I, I think maybe it gets so mainstream that it becomes a lot more affordable. Um, I think some of the tech that's out on the market at the moment is, uh, is quite expensive for the, the benefit uh, that you get off the back of that. So um, I'd say 15 years is my, my guess. Okay. Um, I I'll open this up to you, but perhaps Christian, I'll bring you in on this one first, but you were talking about, um, you know, kind of expert um, operators, more sort of novice uh, employees when it comes to the handling and loading tasks. What, what's your sort of um, experience and reflection on how you get the workforce to buy into the adoption of, of some of the equipment that can help? Because I guess one of the big challenges uh, Kim will know as well is, is how do you get the employees on side and seeing this equipment as something that helps them perform their job rather than something that's been I don't know sort of brought in from on high from management and and they haven't been consulted so where, where do you see that sort of buying coming in I'll speak more slowly sorry and <laughs> um, so the questions around um, how do you get the workforce the ramp handling teams to support the adoption of the new equipment to be on side with bringing that equipment in and see it as a benefit to their job so your question is uh what we can do to to accept the new equipment yes okay um the the question of uh, soren uh, jensen uh, is uh, very interesting and um we have to to understand that if we don't want accidents in the hold during the handling, if we, if we, we want to, to decrease the, the accident, the injuries, uh, the best way is to have no handlers. And all the handling should be automat automatiz uh, automatized. Um, but if you don't want um, human uh, workers, um, automation will replace all the workers. Um, currently, we, we have uh, some good equipment like a, a power store uh, conveyor and um, the best way to, to accept the, the new equipment is for the workers to, to see how it could work and uh, help him during the handling. And I think uh, slowly automation will, will come um, uh, lit, uh, step by step. Um, mm -hmm. We now we if if we if we choose an equipment, we we have to be sure that the equipment will be uh, used at the, the, best, uh, the best way. So the um, training is very important and uh, regularly uh, retraining also should be implemented during the career. I hope uh, it responds, it, it is a good answer for you. Indeed, yeah, thank you, Christian. And um, if I can add to that, Max, yeah, John, uh, yeah, go for it. Um, 
how do we make sure operators use say equipment in, in, in the right way or why how did how do why do why should they adapt it? Mm -hmm. for, for me this is relatively easy. Um, if the operator doesn't want to use it, the design wasn't good enough. And it's very simple. We park say we park a traditional belt loader and a power stow in a parking stand and we have one aircraft coming in and we don't tell the operator anything. If he walks out and he grabs a power stop, that's the product he wants. If he takes the other one, all right, then apparently the power stop or whatever product we're using wasn't good enough. So I would say that in the end, the operator will use it if it's a good product. So we don't necessarily need to convince him because the product should convince him himself. When we, we, we had our first transfer belt of power stow, um, I had a complaint from the operators and they said, why do we only have one? Why don't we have three? And it's like, okay, so if that's your biggest complaint, it must have been a good product. So in the end, we don't, if, if you really need to push something to someone, the product simply wasn't good enough. Sure. And I see from the videos that we saw that mm. you showed Kim, and, and I'll come to you next, that um, yeah. if I'm working in that hole, not twisting and turning, uh, you know, by, by using that product, then it's got to be, a more enjoyable task and a more satisfying task and less risk of injury. Um, Kim, sorry, you want to make a point? Yeah, I'll say, uh, Yelma, that issue, last issue spoke about we can do um, everything to solve that. That's not a problem. <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll, take, that we'll just take a 10% cut of GHI. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, that, uh, um, uh, first of all, I'll say that, that uh, narrow body aircrafts, they will stay for a long, long, long time because you have a new generation, or let's say a, a, they still have a lifetime. So, um, and, and when we get the, the one starting with the MAX also out, that, there'll be, a, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying you're right, Jerry, for the next 15 years, uh, that there will be the, the situation inside the hole for sure. Uh, and we also see from our experience that. Uh, let's say helping tools that has been available to have uh, mounted inside the holes uh, are also uh, strongly reduced, but that is another theme that has to look on how do the airline look on their business. And that just means that when they take that out, the handlers have to uh, find a solution how to, let's say, compensate for this. Um, so that is a trend we have seen uh, quite a lot. Okay, thank you. And from our side, uh, for sure, uh, what is important, and I think it's like, uh, I compare it to like when you want to buy a car, you, uh, maybe some do it on the internet, but I certainly don't. I go down, I want to touch it, I want to drive around and find out is this the right car for me. So, uh, definitely, uh, that also I can only speak about what we're doing. We uh, always offer uh, uh, handlers of airports, whatever, to test the product to be yes. sure that uh, this is the right one because yeah you can you can see the benefits but if you don't have the they say the people on the ramp to work with it uh, it makes no sense so definitely it's quite important to everybody around it will you okay. yeah great thank you kim i've got a question here for you jan uh, from corey corey clark who asked uh, can you speak a bit more about the four hour class uh, your managers are giving to people coming back so can you elaborate on those classes please yeah, of course I can. Uh, it's actually set up as a kind of a brush up uh, for basic safety procedures uh, after the coming back. We just uh, make a, a roundup and there will be a, a major part of it will be a communication, especially between the old handlers on the ramp up against the new handlers from the uh, sorting area of how to handle this specific aircraft who are doing what, so uh, nobody gets hurt, no aircraft damages, no damage on equipment, and that we get the uh, aircraft offloaded according to the internal procedures. And uh, including on that four hour seminar, there will be some uh, two types of uh, teamworks. And uh, one of them is that uh, they have to uh, put a motorbike together, uh, uh, and only one of them knows how to do it. So uh, that's one of the team uh, works that they have to do, similar to how you offload a lot uh, without dialogue. So uh, that's the main part of it, that uh, we do the right things 
every time and that we communicate so we do the right things. I hope yeah. that. Yeah, that sounds like it's very innovative things to, that you're doing to foster um, you know, teamwork and um, you know, re-engage people. Um, Gary, it's something you mentioned in your presentation. I was just interested to know a bit more. You talked about that, um, I guess, the sort of frailty amongst people coming back in a, a, a kind of, not despondency, but I, I think that obviously the situation, um, the, the impact that COVID has had and the fact that they, you know, they have had the shock uh, to their lives over the past sort of five six months it, it, it's it is something people come back in with, with that weight on their mind when they come back into work can you tell us a bit more about how that how that manifests and some of the things that you've you've encountered from your employees um i, I think we we probably saw people with more like the anxiety disorders mm. um, maybe possible depression or like the the isolation exacerbated that that level that they had um but I think kind of on the flip coin, that because of what we did in terms of making sure that we had occupational health, that we had mental health um, providers, but where people could call up if they had issues, if they were suffering. So it was you know, a third party that would, would support them through that process. Um, and I think that went through all levels and the communication on that was you know, pretty every week was they were getting something or they were getting recognition. And in fact, one of the things we actually noticed was um, not that we forgot about them, but the people who stayed working throughout, because we did actually have quite a lot of people who stayed working throughout that we maybe forgot about them. So we had to then put some refocus back on to make sure that everybody, everybody got treated the same way. Um, but I think we just did it through communication and having the right partnerships in place already. Um, and so we, we did a lot of work in the last year in terms of emergency response plans, but never to the level of a pandemic. So that was the shock. Mm. So. Um, I think we've dealt with it quite well. Um, again, I think it's just making sure that, that if your, your company leadership team are onto that, which we already had, so it's that the battle was half fought for me. I didn't have to tell people about it because the, the buy-in was already there. And I suppose sometimes that can be the problem from the leadership team if they're not willing to come with you on that journey and start that process to, to, to engage other companies to come in and give that support. Thanks, Gary. Um, along the same lines, Jelma, it's something you spoke about, but you said that um, obviously we've seen a reduction in volume and whereas you might have been coming in, um, you know, particularly as a ramp team and, and turning one air aircraft after the other, you now perhaps do one, you have a four hour window, then you do another. Does that lead to a, uh, a loss of sharpness in terms of your, your skill set in turning the aircraft that perhaps, you know, the, not consciously but sort of subconsciously to actually lose that safety awareness um, as a result of that reduction in volume what are your thoughts um i'd say apparently there are um, a couple of years ago we have seen a lot of people who uh, were encountering burnouts and nowadays you see society is seeing bore outs so um what, what you see as well is indeed if you are i mean if you're working people most of what i'd say my colleagues like working, that's why we work at, 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 in the aviation. Uh, but if you come on duty and you do something and then you have to wait for three hours and then do something again, it really feels like waiting and it's quite difficult to switch from, all right, first I was doing nothing for, 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 for maybe two hours and then you have 25 minutes to do a turnaround and actually reboosting that but takes quite some espressos. So I do see that it is a risk, at least we're aware of it, but it's nothing we've seen before. So, um, so, so we're used to really continuously uh, having, having pressure basically, but it feels like if you have pressure and then no pressure and then pressure again, was really a challenge for a lot of stuff. Thanks, Jim. Right. Resolved that, yeah. I, I will move on to, um, to some submitted questions here. It's uh, first one here from Peter, Peter Hewitt. Hi, Peter. Uh, it's for you, Jelma and Gary. Uh, you both spoke about paperless ramp, which is an important development even before COVID-19. Uh, what, what are your views on this? And have you already had airlines approach you guys to look at digital solutions for uh, CLC? Low control, cargo low control? Uh, Gary, you want to start or? I'll be fine to take it off mute. <laughs> um, 
So um, we have our own uh, built system for handling our, our turnarounds and our cargo flights. Um, it's all done on iPad. Um, we don't necessarily have any airline functions with full CLC, but we do some load planning uh, for some of the airlines. Um, but again, we just had that at the core of what we were doing. So it was, um, we, we find it's a benefit. We, we embrace technology to the fullest. Um, and uh, we've still got a long way to go. I think we, it's about interconnecting the systems now is, is probably one of the biggest challenges uh, we're, we're looking to face. Uh, just to give us some good insights on data and, and how to how to be even more proactive than we already are being. So um, that's our stance on the use of technology, but not so much CLC. Same with us, not, not only on, on CLC, but for example, we do collaborate with the fueling company. So we are working on the same platform. And for example, when we have a receive a type B message or a fuel message, we automatically pass that, we make it available for the fueler. So also we have third parties at the airport who are working in the system and that's also paperless, no phones, no notes, no nothing um, to make sure that we always have the right information available at the right actor. So that's brought us many things. Thank you. Um, next question is from Sabina, Sabina Mwanga. Hi Sabina, who says passenger aircraft are now being used to transport cargo craters, cargo in the cabin. Um, they're not designed as cargo aircraft, which means there is uh, lots of lifting needed to load and unload cargo. More lifting um, means higher likelihood of injury. How is the industry addressing this new area? Um, anyone take that? Uh, just to say that if, if you looked back at our cargo, <laughs> our cargo webinar, we did, we did discuss um, David Bunting from JBT, a uh, uh, cargo chute that was under development for unloading those protests, but Jelmo, how are you guys tackling that, um, that particular challenge? Cargo, so, cargo. I guess, is it, are you seeing more, more sort of combined protests, cargo in the cabin? I, I was saying we don't have cargo, so I can't answer that question. And I suppose from, from our side, Max, we, we have cargo, cargo volume increased actually during lockdown, mm. but, um, not, we've, we're not one of the, the handlers who, in any of our operations, are using aircraft uh, in the cabin for cargo. But certainly volumes increased, numbers of flights have increased, and um, yeah, that's the only effect it's had on us so far. Okay, thanks guys. Let's move on then to a question from Robin Marino. Hi Robin, what's the importance of uh, the agent low situational awareness while driving or walking on the apron? in your safety risk analysis. Do you consider digital solutions as a good answer to mitigate this risk and to provide the ramp agent um, more valuable information directly? Well, we have looked, oh, sorry, Gary, go ahead. Um, I think, again, just on top of that, uh, as standard, we have telematics equipment in all of our, our motorized equipment, which gives you at the ton of reports, um, we, we do use it a lot in accident investigation. It gives us a lot of insight, especially, um, which is, uh, or even near misses, but we'll take that as a learning lesson and, and, and factor that into some proactiveness about education on drivers. And that, that will drive a lot of the campaigns that we do against safe driving. Uh, possibly not a, a screen in the cabin that tells the driver if it's good or not, but maybe that's the future of it. I don't know. But now telematics for sure, full telematics is, uh, has been a bonus for us since we brought that in. Okay. Jelma, did you want to add? Yeah, well, the, indeed, safety awareness. I mean, the, there is plenty of technology which can help, for example, with geofencing. And then if you drive, uh, for example, on the, um, um, on, on the road, you can do 25 kilometers an hour. But if you enter a parking stand, you can only do five. Now, theoretically, you can all program it and make sure that your equipment doesn't drive too fast but we want to make sure it's in the hands of the, the operator because otherwise you just leave everything to technology but we want to make them aware so we just train them and explain to them why and basically we have no issue with that okay thank you i've got a question here for you kim uh, which asks what is the approximate weight of power store equipment uh, and how do you transport or take it into the cargo hold well, uh, I, think I, I think I'll put the, the answer a little bit the way around because 
the power store equipment is uh, at the moment uh, we mounted on four different kind of bell loaders. Um, so uh, and and what we do, as you might have seen on a small video shown, uh, we actually touch the, the the floor of the aircraft. So we are docking inside the hold, which we also uh, cable doing according to the eight nine two five A. If somebody wants to read that, but um, end of the day means that when we are docking on the on the airplane, the, there's auto level function in the system that makes sure that it will follow the airplane up and down all time. And then you just simply use the hands in front and can uh, take the roller track inside. So there's a gear motor helps you doing that. So yes, there's a weight of the equipment, uh, the roller track itself, but it's spread over a long distance. You can reach up to seven meters inside. Um, so yes, there's a weight, but the main weight is outside on the, on the build loader itself and do not have anything or disturb anything what you're doing inside the aircraft. Thank you, Kim. Um, Jan, a question for you. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how to control aircraft hold damages, floor, wall and ceiling, especially for A320s where bulk loading is done? Yeah, uh, uh, items uh, we're using, uh, uh, which we have bought from a factory, uh, making them for construction, moving over soft ground. Uh, we have cut them into three pieces, the, uh, the board platforms, and made it like a puzzle. And uh, they will be placed on the CLG-8 loaders. And uh, for all three trenches, we are using three, which is connected, as I said, like a puzzle. And uh, the mini forklifter, as you saw on one of the pictures, the green one, is uh, transporting the items, 70 kilos or more, inside the hole. And then it's, it's, uh, afterwards it's secured, strapped or whatever it needed, and then the platforms are picked out again and placed on a hold uh, on a on the CLC8 loader. Okay. So that's uh, causing no damage to the uh, aircraft hold. Thank you, Jan. Thank you for that. Um, a question here, uh, which is anonymous, says. The adoption of technology and new ways of working is a legacy issue in the ground handling market and until everyone works together to bring the handling of aircraft into the 21st century at the correct cost and revenue contribution, we will constantly keep repeating the mistakes of the past. The race to the bottom has started again and looks set to carve up and possibly reduce the market of handlers across the world. Can we cheer that um, person up and talk about perhaps, uh, some of you touched on it, how stakeholder collaboration has come into play since COVID-19 in, in restarting operations safely and, and, a, and a comment on that pessimistic view, shall we call it? I wouldn't say we were, in, I mean, obviously the margins are thin, but, but we, we believe that with the right quality, we, we see a change in the race to the bottom, like the ultra low cost carriers have also been punished and they, they're increasing their service model as well. So the, really the ultra, ultra low cost model is, you see those parties changing. And I mean, even though our margins are thin, it's not a race to the bottom. And we are collaborating. We are collaborating with airlines. We're collaborating with airport authorities. We are collaborating with the fire department. So as long as you've got the good mindset and, and you're willing to believe that you can collaborate, then I see plenty of collaboration opportunities. I wouldn't be so negative. But we do have to realize it's not changed overnight. It's not changed in six months. It's a, it's a long-term philosophy you have to adhere to, but please don't be so negative. <laughs> it will be fine. And Gary, you, you gave some examples there of where you've worked with airline customers as part of your restart. Um, can, you, can you elaborate a bit more about that, the power of stakeholder collaboration? Yeah, I think um, especially before I entered aviation, I was in logistics um, and also our managing director. So I think there's certainly, you know, the cost per term model has probably seen a bit of this drive to the bottom. And I think the, the reduction in volumes is it's probably not going to return until 2023, 24. We're hoping sooner. Um, but I think that, you know, we're not going to really jump much past that. I think for me personally, I don't know if anyone shares a view, but I think until the industry is regulated, I think that's probably one of the key turning points that might help us in terms of 
um, you know, not just taking the lowest prize handler for a, a turnaround. Um, I don't think it does the industry any good. It's certainly not what our kind of mindset is in terms of going out into the market. So, um, but yeah, I think there has to be a change and I, I just hope it's not something that happens that's, that's catastrophic that ends up changing it. I think, you know, the industry should get together and we do a, a lot of good work in the UK in, in what's uh, called the Ghost, um, which is with the CAA, where we partnership with airports, airlines, other ground handlers, and we try to make changes for the good. Um, I do think regulation is probably one of the ways where it says, no, we have to have this, this safety look, that cannot be negotiated. And then that just drives kind of a baseline price. And uh, maybe that's what I think the best for the future will hold. And, I don't know anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, right, I'm now going to ask the audience to uh, vote on a few of our questions. So if I can load the first one of those questions up um, in the next few seconds. Uh, we're asking, have you conducted any refresher safety training before deploying, redeploying ramp teams back into active service um, ahead of a restart on your operation? So uh, I think Jan touched on this and, and, and Jelma and Gary have I just mentioned it too. Have you conducted any refresher safety training activity when bringing those teams back? Vote now, yes or no. There we go. Hopefully that's all working. Um, I'm hoping I can load up the second question if the technology holds up. He's very ambitious here. There we go. If I can help, help load up the second poll question, um, which is asking what is the biggest barrier to your station adopting more GSE? So we've heard from Powerstow this afternoon uh, that will assist ramp teams with heavy lifting and manual handling during ground activity. So, so what are the biggest obstacles to you doing more uh, with GSE and equipment? Is it cost? Is it lack of workforce support for new ways of working? Is it a lack of understanding about the performance benefits of that equipment um, or is it just not identified as a business priority? So if you could vote for your chosen answer now, please. And finally, in a couple of seconds, when that one is done, we are going to ask you um, what impact you think any um, the implementation of physical distancing uh, of teams during ramp activity will have on the risk of employee injury or the likelihood of aircraft damage. So if we can get it to work in a, in a second, we will ask you the final question, what impact do you think any requirements for physical distancing of teams during ramp activity will have on the risk of employee injury or the likelihood of aircraft damage? Do you think it's going to be a heightened risk? Um, do you think it will actually reduce the risk or do you just see that as a non-issue, not a change um, in risk level at all? So if you can vote on that final question now, we'll share the answers with you um, once we send around the post webinar information slides and recording. So please vote now and thanks for doing that for us. We'll share the results later. Um, I don't know if any of the panel we've got about three or four minutes left wanted to comment on, on any of those questions that came up or um, Jan you mentioned something in, in your talk around um, lifting of very heavy items where it was perhaps a two-person job and that would no longer be possible under physical distancing can you, can you talk to us a bit more about that and your, your proposed countermeasure? Uh, yeah uh, uh, handling heavy load uh, heavy items inside the cargo hold is that what Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, but my, my speakers are chopping up again, but uh, using um, uh, items uh, weighing more than 79 kilos, it, as I said, it has to be on a forkliftable wooden pallet or similar. So we can use the mini forklift, which was uh, the green one placed on the CLT-8 loader. Uh, that's uh, an, a one-man operation, or possible two if it's an extremely heavy item. And uh, it is uh, wheeled into the cargo hold and placed directly on the floor on the wooden pallet. And then it's uh, the, the pallet lifter is t t uh, taken out again. And it's running easily, but uh, it could be a two-man handling if the uh, item is very, very heavy. Okay, thank you, Jan. 
Um, we've got a couple of minutes. I'm just going to look to get through uh, a couple of these questions in that time, if we possibly can. Um, there was one here a moment ago that I saw that was quite an interesting one, maybe to conclude on. Uh, here, well, here's one from Michael uh, Panagulias, who asks, if all airlines had sliding carpets in their holds, the back injuries will be less. But as I know, uh, only Airbus has sliding carpets. Boeing hasn't. Um, so we have to convince airlines and manufacturers. And that actually relates to the question I just seem to have lost. Um, was a question along those lines, just sort of emphasizing that we obviously have the equipment under development. We've heard about some of the equipment that's on the market from Kim today. Uh, we've talked about new automation and opportunities. Um, I've lost the question, but it, the sense of it was, we know the equipment's there and there's more equipment coming that can help us. So how do we align the various stakeholder groups to ensure that we adopt these innovations within the ground handling industry and we make sure that we utilize some of the great stuff that, that is already out there and that is coming our way? Well, I think if I, should, if I can answer that question because, mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, I, I am a producer of equipment to help people inside the cargo hold. And what we see is that, uh, like I said, more and more car, uh, more and more bulk is coming. Uh, yes, other systems like this mentioned has been there for a while also before uh, Power Stove came around. I think what today uh, uh, airlines, because I think that then you're going to the airline side, they of course have to look at, uh, yes, um, the industry is tough. We have to see on our earnings, uh, how do we use our money the best way when we are flying around. So, um, we are investing a lot of money in new uh, aircrafts. It can be the Neo or Max, or whatever. Why do we do that? We do that to improve the economy on the airplane. So should we still have something inside? There is a, actually a dead weight, uh, costing a lot of money in fuel costs. That is uh, my, my let's say straight, straight answer to that. So that's why I think we have seen that the clients uh, also that we have. Uh, where they actually airlines have removed uh, inside uh, equipment uh, to save this cost and then using the benefits of the power store. Thanks. Another thing is that when you do that, and uh, not only on the packs, especially on the cargo side, uh, as more you can remove inside the holes, you get free space. And if you see it on the cargo side, uh, free space means uh, space for more which is equal to more income. So there is, there's also, let's say, an economical aspect in that from, from the airline. And Thank then we you. can go um, in and help with, the, with the, let's say, the safety and, and the health environment uh, part of it. And I'll just pass the same question to, to some concluding thoughts really uh, across the panel. So how do we drive that um, collaboration coordination to adopt some of the innovative kit that is going to help us load and um, and, and turn aircraft more safely, efficiently, and, and on time. Um, Yelmar, I'll come to you first. Uh, your question chopped up, but uh, uh, I think we have, a, as I mentioned earlier in some other issues, that we have to make a dialogue with the uh, airlines and some, some, I think it was uh, Gary who talked about the airport as well, because they own some part of mm -hmm. the things that we're using. But it had to be made in a dialogue with the, the manufacturer, the airlines, and the ground handlers. Thank you, Jan. Um, Jelma, Christian? Oh, I think it might be on me. Repeat the question. The, um, um, so, say, sorry, Jelma. But the, um, we can say we, we have to discuss this with the airlines, but because it's not their process, it's not their problem. So I can understand that the airline says, well, it's not my problem. So, well, the other party, who is the, it's usually the guy with the problem that has to resolve it. So I would say that would be up to the ground handling industry and not necessarily airlines. I, I agree with you, gentlemen, that it is not uh, their problem, but it could be their problem if the equipment is very, very bad and it's hitting the aircraft. So I think that a dialogue uh, between the ground handlers and the airline is important. But again, you're right, it's not their problem, it's ours. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, and if I could just counter-argue that, I think like with the sliding carpets, and, and sorry to be provocative, but when they took that equipment out, they, they removed the problem for them, but just shifted that onto somebody else. So it's a classic case of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, 
again, I think that change in the industry is the one thing. I, I think it's it's more uh, reform that's needed more than anything else because, again, um, we if ground handlers are forced to operate at the, the cheapest price, um, they're certainly going to look for shortcuts. And unfortunately, safety, training, uh, people, well-being, they're always the first things that go out of the door when you want to save um, any kind of capital. Um, and again, I think, in fact, I don't actually have that issue uh, at Stobart. We don't have back injuries, but I think that's because we've got some really good contracts actually in our stations where we have enough people on the turnaround where we can use conventional boat loaders and we can still social distance and we still don't see that risk uh, even based on coming from a much larger ground handle where I came from, which was kind of, you know, a much higher percentage probably um, up into the dozens. So I, I don't know. I think it's horses for courses. I, I, I do think um, there needs to be that triangle of airline, airport and ground handler. Um, whereas I think it should be for pushing at each other and we're not really a collaboration. Um, I think something we always try to do as well is we look at what other industries do, and I think we brought that coming from logistics, but uh, we look at what construction do. You know, construction has the same model where they contract out a lot of the work, but if you subcontract work out, you then still become responsible for that subcontractor. That's not mm -hmm. visible in this industry. So if I have an injury on, on an aircraft, the airline just says, not my problem, it's your problem, but in construction, that would be, no, you're coming down with me as well, if, if uh, to use that kind of phrase. But that's, I think, the problem that's a bigger pandemic and is, is endemic in our industry. And, and that's, I think, what should be resolved before uh, just trucking engineering solutions. I've seen the power still work. It's great. Personally, we, we don't use that um, currently operations. But um, I think there's other things you can do as well, other than engineering controls. Just seeing some of the other comments from particularly the African stations there, you, you might not have, have ever seen one. So um, I think there's, you've got to always view the argument on both sides. I think, yeah, it's great equipment works, <laughs> but I think it can be paid for over the cracks sometimes. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'll come to you, Kim. Christian, I'll yeah. just come to you and then I'll finish with you, Kim. Um, Christian, just the question was uh, around how we drive collaboration between airport, airline and handler to adopt some of this equipment that can help improve um, performance. I don't know how it's possible to convince airlines to, to change uh, uh, something in, in the aircraft. I don't know what you think about that. All the panelists? I think, I think I'll give this like uh, Jan and Yelba maybe touched on it. If it is related to uh, you know the, the performance, the safety, um, then it is an issue. Obviously, an airline is going to want to own and, and want to see the benefit if it results in you know, a better OTP score or an improved safety outcome um, that's got to matter to airlines right what, what was your question Christian sorry I think just seeing trying to get the airlines on board with the with the adoption of um, the equipment but I mean we're running long time but I think if you're gonna see it improve handling performance OTP safety I think those things will get that airline's attention uh, and see them get on board, I would hope. Um, we are running low on time, so Kim, I'll very quickly come to you and then I'll Yeah, I just want to say that, uh, well, there's many airlines around the world, but uh, we see airlines really who do want to have this discussion. And I think it's important that, that we as a manufacturer, uh, who also are, are, let's say, part of this group, so it's like us, it's like the airlines, like the ground handlers, all together have these discussions. How should this world be also in the future? Uh, but because end of the day, let's say we are connected one way or another. Um, so and, and like here, we are quite open to here at any time. If there's any suggestions, ideas, uh, problems, whatever, uh, to to take up the dialogue. And that's also how we develop as a company. I mean, if uh, Jerry uh, didn't tell me what is this world, or Jan did it, uh, Christian, Yelma, whatever, how should we learn um, how how things could be better? So. Um, I think we are quite open for, for such kind of uh, discussions and uh, welcome any input, so. Okay, well, um, we are right out of time. Thank you very much to everyone on the panel for your presentations and comments this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you who've logged in and joined us. We hope you've enjoyed the session. We'll send around the papers and the recording for you tomorrow. And um, I look forward to seeing you in Copenhagen. So take care and we'll see you again very soon.
Strong possibility of another GHI webinar in between to watch this space. Thanks again. Take care. See you in Denmark at the end of November. Take care, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.